Hey everyone who is watching us, welcome to Day One Careers, our weekly YouTube Amazon interview Q&A. My name is Yevgeny, um, together with Gigi we run Day One Careers and yeah, welcome to the show. So Gigi is running just a little bit late um, and um, but we're going to start and we are going to answer any of the questions related to Amazon interviewing that you have for the next hour. Now, I'm just going to give uh, folks a couple of minutes to join. And while um, you guys are all joining, I'm just going to give you a little bit of intro about myself in case uh, you don't know who I am. So my name is Yevgeny, as I mentioned before. Um, I have been in big technology businesses for over four years, of which um, I worked at Amazon for uh, just over three years, and then I spent one year at Apple. And prior to that, I um, had a 15-year-old career in European FMCG companies. Here's Gigi is coming um, very quickly. Gigi, I was just introducing myself to folks who might not have been a in shows. Um, yeah, welcome, Gigi. Right, hello. So I literally just put the phone down to the phone. It's not like we're on the phone anymore. It's from 1990. <laughs> yes, it is. I um, uh, I think your mic might be a little bit. Oh, okay. Hang on, hang on. You might as well. Hello, hello. Can you hear yes. me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, we can. <laughs> anyway, let me just finish introducing myself and then. Um, I guess straight to you. So um, Gigi and I run day one careers. I've uh, been a senior leader in Amazonian for over three years. And um, since leaving Amazon, um, I've pretty much coached hundreds of candidates. I don't remember how many, but it's definitely somewhere between three or four and four uh, in four, 400. But who's counting? So anyway, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, my husband's just stepped in the room. Hello, honey. Can I help you with something? Okay. Right. Sorry, everyone. You can see my husband walking past there. Sorry about that. Okay. And now my dog's coming in the room as well. It's, it's a party here. Right. So I kind of missed half of what Evgeny said. But yes, so uh, we are the day one crew. <laughs> I've been so drunk off. Got and keep reminding on. yourself that yes, we are yes, the we day are, one careers. We are day one careers. And I'm it. Right, so yes, we have a, a whole ecosystem of things going on to support people for their Amazon interview coaching. The reason why Evgeny and I started doing what we do, and we started independently of each other and then met and beautiful moment when we met, is that we we're coaching people and so interviewing people whilst we're at Amazon and realized that kind of people who got expert support did a lot better than people that didn't. And I know I got curious and just started Googling it and found out that at least at the time, which was about two years ago now, if you wanted expert Amazon interview support, it was going to cost you a tiny packet. So I started out my YouTube channel. I think Evgeny started just giving amazing free coaching to candidates at Amazon and managed to pass them through to the next round and they started to do much better. And from then, we both built out kind of our independent um, businesses to support Amazon interview candidates and then have come together quite recently. We offer a extensive YouTube channel now with tons of info. Of course, you know that because you're here. We've got the Day One Careers website that's got an amazing blog on it. We have our courses. We do coaching. We drop content on LinkedIn. So we're here for you. And part of what we do is obviously these free sessions. So the way this works, everyone who's there, I can see there's a few people there is you just drop your questions along the side there in the little comment section. We'll check them out and we will bring them in and try and answer them for you. We have a couple of requests. First of all, please don't ask very generic questions. Hi, Gigi Evgeny, I've got an interview tomorrow for a technical program manager, any tips? The answer is yes, hours of them, and it's all on the YouTube channel. Equally, very specific questions about the fact that, hi, Gigi, I've got a, I don't know, a building management control interview tomorrow. Can you tell me what the technical um, test is going to include? 
No, sorry. There are thousands of functional roles in Amazon, and unfortunately, we don't know the technical kind of requirements and testing regimes of all of them. So some things we are not going to be answering or able to answer. But in general, I reckon we hit about 90% of the questions that are asked of us. So with that said, why don't you just start banging down your questions there in the comment section on the right? It looks a bit light today. Usually there's far more than that by now. So please do go crazy. Put your questions down. Um, gosh, I don't know what my husband's doing over there. He's digging away in a box over there. So if you're hearing rumbling noises, I apologize. Is there some of the door open? So I'm going to go close that. So whilst you're all banging down your questions, I'm going to close the door. Oh, he's leaving. It's all right. He came. <laughs> He left. He came, he saw, he made a mess, and then he left. Right, he on. came, he saw, he made it awkward. Anyway, let's no. keep going. I have no shame, Evgeny, you know that, and everybody in the audience knows I have no shame as well. If they've watched any of my videos, they know I have no shame and no ego, so I'm fine with that. Right, come on then, people. Throw us up some questions, and we will attempt to answer them. So we've got a few here, so... Why don't we just get going? And we'll say hello to people as they arrive. It's always nice to be nice, as my granny used to say to me. So we will try and say hello to people. And hopefully we'll have a few people back who have been with us for a while. So shall I um, man the console, Evgeny? And then... This time, this time maybe you shall. And then next time I shall. Okay. <laughs> very egalitarian over here, isn't it? <laughs> very, very egalitarian. Right. So what do we have? Dylan, Pinda, oh, you're saying thank you. You are more than welcome. Right, what do we have? Oh, that's a good question, Arkit. It's not really interview, but I've never had one like this. So we're going to go for this one whilst everybody else writes down their questions. So Arkit, what advice would we give to someone who's about to join Amazon in a month as a senior I don't know what a senior what don't know but okay we'll do generic advice here what makes a successful amazonian so shall i have a go first and then evgeny you can throw let's in do it your thoughts. all right so here's the advice that i gave and give to everybody who's a new joiner at amazon which is prepare to feel like a complete fraud and wonder how it is that you possibly got through the door. Because when you join Amazon, obviously you are feeling a million pounds, dollars, rubles, pesos, whatever it is, because you've managed to crack what is probably the most difficult interview, corporate interview process on the globe. Then you walk through the door, you sit in your first meeting and everyone around you seems so much more competent, so much more intelligent and so much um, more articulate than you feel you could ever be. And your confidence, where's my camera? Your confidence goes like that. And it happens like that for everybody, no matter what level you're at. I've had these conversations with pe people who have entered at VP level, and I've had these conversations with people who have entered at L4 level, and everybody goes through the same pattern where you lose your confidence because everyone else around you knows so much more than you. And of course they do. They've been there longer than you. Hold out for six months because, again, everybody, this is a pattern for everybody, you hit a point at six months where suddenly everything clicks. I don't know what it is, but there's like a magic point at six months where suddenly it all starts to make sense and your trajectory just like skyrockets. So my biggest piece of advice is, Keep the faith you got in because you deserved to get in and just hold out because when you hit the very bottom or what appears to be the very bottom at six months, suddenly you will absolutely skyrocket. So I think that's what I think makes a successful Amazonian in the first year is to just dig in, hold your nerve, keep learning, don't be embarrassed. Ask all the questions that you feel you need to ask. There are no stupid questions. And you will get to a point where suddenly the light turns on and you're accelerating off. That's my best piece of advice. Evgeny, 
Do you have one? Yes, a tiny one. Something that I've actually given to uh, an alumni of Day One Careers who's currently going through this six-month journey, a very interesting period. And my advice was, um, however it goes, you're going to find yourself under a little bit of stress just because you know the situation is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to learn this much in such a compressed period of time. So my advice to him was, don't psych yourself about trying to get some sort of 90-day milestones, deliverables, because I can tell you as someone who used to manage people, and I'm, I'm hoping Gigi will support me here, we know that when you join, um, I'm not going to say you're a liability, but we don't expect a lot. <laughs> Even though, even though we will keep piling on that work list, of course, because learning by doing is the best thing to do. But during the first six months, to be honest, if you manage to accomplish something, um, then you know that's a that's a big win. And the second piece of advice is try to work with your manager to get yourself some some early wins to score. When I was a hiring manager, and the new hire comes to say, "Look, I'm really overwhelmed, but I want to score some early wins," I'm going to say, "You know what? Here's what you can do." And most managers will collaborate. That will be mine. Cool. Excellent. Very sage advice there. So I'm going to move on, Arkit. Hopefully that was insightful for you. And congratulations. We both, we all at Day One Careers wish you a very happy Amazon career. And don't forget us when you become a hiring manager. We'll still be here. Moving on then. Okay. So Douglas, welcome. I'm going to bring up this question. What follow-up questions can one expect when responding to loop questions? So, Evgeny, I'm going to pass this over to you because I know you know what I would say to this. Yes, I do. Yes, so I'm I do. going to let you say what I would say. Shoot. Well, um, I would say that... Um, well, actually, actually, I don't know what you would say. You know, you <laughs> yeah, think yeah. you you think that I know. Let's see. Let's <laughs> see if the minds will meet here. So, I um I believe that um there are two biggest sort of most popular types of follow up questions. Number one is a double click on numbers and facts, just literally going one level deeper into the factual details of the stories. And the purpose of that type of interrogation is to, well, A, a certain that things did take place, and B, to just make sure that the behaviors that you have been hopefully demonstrating through your stories really map to the leadership principles and um, the, the level signals that um, uh, they would expect for the kind of role that you're applying to. And the second um, big type of questions is why. Amazonians are... A lot of them are very left-brained individuals, and they love to understand why things are the way they are, both internally, within the business. They love asking questions why, and they also love asking candidates why. They love to understand not just what you did, but what mental frameworks you had that were driving you to do what you did. So that would be my um, understanding based on my own experience. Gigi, what's yours? Okay. So I think the point that you're making, so I think you're absolutely right there in terms of those two types of questions. Uh, the point that we're making is that although we can define types of questions, the actual questions themselves are highly variable depending on what you say. So although in the Amazon Making Great Hiring Decisions training that everybody goes through, there are suggested potential follow-up questions, those very quickly go out the window when you actually sit down with a candidate because the only follow-up questions that you can ask are follow-up questions by definition. You have to have said something first for someone to follow up. So the best thing that I suggest in terms of preparing for possible follow-up questions is to go back to your examples as you plan to tell your stories and ask yourself under those two kind of categories that Evgeny shared, what might they double click on for numbers and data points? And what might they ask me in terms of why 
And of course, that could be across a plethora of different things. And then ask yourself on top of that, if I was to hear this story, is there anything that I might ask follow up questions on? If I can try and imagine somebody else listening to what I have to say, what what doors did I leave open in my example? And in that way, you may be able to go a long way to predicting what questions that you'll be asked in follow up. I don't suggest you try and fill your answer up with all of those anticipated answers to anticipated follow up questions because they may never come, but at least have them in your back pocket and be prepared for them. Okay, cool. I think that's it. So we'll move on. Thank you for that question, Douglas. Um, moving on then. Okay. Oh, yeah. Let's go for this one. So Frenchy French. <laughs> I love people. Great nickname. That's so awesome. Some people have such good ones. Um, okay, so you have an Amazon interview for a non-tech role coming up in a week. Is it good to prepare two different examples for each interviewer? Okay, so um, our guidance in general is that you need to prepare two examples per leadership principle not per interviewer. Now you may know who your interviewer is and what leadership principle they've been assigned. Some candidates do get to know that information. Not everybody, and I don't believe it's the majority, but given how you articulated this question, I think there's possibly a level of data that you might have rather than kind of the general populace. So in principle, two examples per leadership principle. If you happen to know what leadership principles you're going to be interviewed on, that's a massive advantage. If you don't know what leadership principles you're going to be interviewed on, my suggestion is, first of all, ask your recruiter if they will share that information with you. Your odds are about 50-50, I think, of being able to get that information from your recruiter. If you can't get that interview, that information from your recruiter, you need to do a deep dive on the job description. We have two videos on our YouTube channel where I do that live for candidates who have given me their job description. I just go cold looking at those online and deconstructing them. So go watch that because that should give you some tips on how to deconstruct your job description for the key leadership principle. And then as a last resort, we at Day One Careers do offer a service where we do a job description deconstruction for you. But once you get to the point where you believe you know what those leadership principles are, two examples per leadership principle. Would you agree, Evgeny, anything on top of that? A hundred percent. I can't really add anything. My response, it was a very elaborate answer because my response was uh, two per LP. Yes. Next question, please. <laughs> well, that's because you speak with clarity and gravity and I just gavel on. But there we go. No, I By the way, I you look like you're about, I don't know if it looks like you're landing a plane or that you're in kind of the um, control tower there, but that is a serious headset. I feel really inadequate with my headset. You know why that is? Because I'm always <laughs> in the control tower. And I'm with inadequate. <laughs> I right. my gear. <laughs> moving on, moving on. Let's see. Um... I think we can answer Dylan's question very quickly. Where's Dylan's question? Go on, you pull up Dylan's question. I'll pull up Dylan's question. Hey, friends. Hey, Dylan. Is it looked down upon to reach out to a recruiter before the scheduling of the group prep call? I wanted to connect and ask them a couple of questions to leverage all that I can. So I'm going to just go ahead and widen the question because I get the, uh, I don't know, Gigi, I think you get these questions a lot and I do too is it okay for me to reach out to my recruiter because X, Y, and Z? And my answer is yes, at any point in time, whenever you want, reach out to your recruiter and ask questions. There's one thing that we always recommend is that if there's something that's unclear or you want to find something out, always ask questions. I get a lot of candidates that are 
under the impression that for some reason, writing that email to your recruiter or picking up that phone in case there's a phone number is somehow frowned upon, regardless of the reason, I can reassure you that it isn't. In fact, the opposite is true. If you just sit there and if you don't ask the questions that you are dying to ask, that is something that is, I as a hiring manager would find suspicious because it's quite an important decision you're about to make, you know, hunting for jobs. So that would be uh, my guidance. Did you, would you agree? Yes. Can I add something? Uh, yes, please. Okay. So I hypothesize that this comes from a place of fear where candidates think that they will be judged in some way for not being born knowing the answers to these questions. So there's an extra piece of information that I like to give candidates that I think offers some reassurance, which is your recruiter doesn't take part in the decision as to whether to hire you or not. They have skin in the game and therefore they aren't the decision makers in the process. So any concerns that you have about whether they think that you ask too many questions, by the way, you can't, but any concerns that you have, they won't translate into someone going into the decision making process with a bias because that person is not going into the decision making process. So bear that in mind, your recruiter does not take part in the decision as to whether to hire you or not. The other thing I'll say is your recruiter has the same goal as you. They want you to get hired because if you get hired, then tick, they've achieved one of their objectives, which is to fill that vacancy. And two, they can move on to the next task and you're off, that role is off their plate. So if you have questions that will help you be successful, they want to know those questions so that they can help you be successful. Okay, that was my value add on top of. Excellent, as always. Should we move on then? Yes, let's move on. Let's move on. So, shall I pick the next one? We can take it in turn. Yeah, let's well. do it. Awesome. Let's do that. Okay. Uh, ooh, okay. Oh, gee, sir, there's a little bit of a story here. Oh, okay, yes. All right, yes, I will. I will pick this one up. So, Janissa, so you got an offer from Amazon. Congratulations, London or Luxembourg. For a few reasons, you had to decline the offer, and you're disappointed. Oh, I'm sad to hear that. Okay. So, next bit. Ah, oh, you recommend our course. Thank you. But you do have a point to make, so that wasn't just me um, banging our own drum. It's open for six months, and maybe we can speak to how that works. Yes, I can. Or do you want to do this one, Evgeny? I'm not sure I actually understand the question. Oh, okay, I do. I do. That's lucky. So what happens is, if you are extended an offer by Amazon, and you are considered to be bar rating, that offer actually stands for a six-month period of time. So you have the role itself may be gone, but somebody has rubber stamped you as being bar raising and therefore eligible for hire for this particular role at this particular level. So what it means is if for some reason you either decline the role or maybe the role goes on hold or maybe the role disappears because the budget, you know, budget gets cut and the headcount gets taken away, you still have a little rubber stamp over your head saying that a panel have been inclined to hire you for this role at this level. So if you make an application within a six month period for that role at that level, you are effectively pre-approved to have an offer for that role. Now that doesn't mean to say that you won't have to have some kind of an interview. No hiring manager is going to take you straight into their organization on the say-so of you know, five or six people six months ago who they've never heard of and never met and never will. Uh, they would want to speak to you. But the possibility exists that if you reapply for another role at exactly that same level within the next six-month period, what you'd get is just maybe one interview slash green light meeting with a hiring manager to then double rubber stamp you to get an offer. So it's a bit of an edge case, Janisha, but it does happen and it is possible. Okay, moving on then. 
I think uh, we've got a question from Guido. Okay, you take that one, Dan. Yep. I'll, t- I'll take that one. So the question is, hey, Guido, <clears throat> love the, uh, the avatar. May the force be with you always. Um, so what advice would you give to rock the phone interview? Um, I wish I could say show up in a Darth Vader outfit, um, but probably it's not a good idea. I don't idea. know, so, some dev teams might quite like that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Possible. Possible. Although, although from from my experience, um, they're um, you know they're kind of equivocating between uh, um, Star Wars and Game of Thrones when I was there. Yeah, you, you could end up landing on the wrong side of that. Exactly, the wrong side <laughs> of the force. Anyway, I'm gonna stop here and uh, actually answer the question. So, uh, uh, in order to um, rock the phone interview, now um, just to step back, uh, differently to the loop. On a panel interview, the phone interviews at Amazon, as they call them, phone interviews, even though it's, you know, most of them are over time, um, they don't tend to follow the same or a very sort of uh, the same script as as uh, closely as the loop uh, interviews tend to follow. So they're not completely random, but um, they uh, phone phone interviews they do tend to assemble them from various different building blocks. So um, the uh, the scope of that phone interview in terms of the types of questions that they're going to be asking you might be a little bit wider than that of the loop, which doesn't mean that you can't prepare for a great phone interview. It's just you need to anticipate that you know phone interviews these days they are a bit loosey goosey, so to say. That being said, the most um, typical building blocks of a phone interview that you can and should prepare prepare yourself for they are as follows: number one, why Amazon? A motivation check on the candidate. So um, a good idea would be to prepare your motivation story. That's why you want to w- w- join the business and that particular team. Number two, tell me about yourself, also known as, or potentially followed by, in various different cases, walk me through your resume. That is a functional check. Now, um, in most, oh, I would say, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm not going to say in most cases, in some cases, they can just establish or reassert in your functional fit to the particular role just by looking at your CV. And in fact, that's, you know, that's quite efficient. Some choose to, to follow this up in an in-person conversation with you during the phone interview, just to you know, place a couple of more ticks in the boxes and ascertain that, that you are the right functional fit for the role. So do prepare your pitch as to um, you know, why, um, uh, why your experience and accomplishments to date um, make you get higher from a functional perspective. And they also will uh, sometimes throw a leadership principle question at you, so a behavioral interview question um, at you. Um, And um, that means that it would be a really good idea to have an understanding of what these leadership principles are, start preparing, writing down your content, and practice on your delivery of the STAR stories, the coherent stories in the STAR method. Now, There is no expectation in the phone screen that you will be raising the bar on anything. Um, That being said, it is quite commonplace to encounter these three types of questions. And if you are sufficiently prepared, I think you've got every chance to rock the phone into you. Gigi, anything to add? Other than be prepared for anything, I really think (laughs) to summarize that up, there are um, so many different ways of going about that phone screen. Like there's at least three different approaches that they can take and every team gets to choose their own approach. So you just got to be prepared for as well as you can be prepared for anything. So be prepared to have to know all you know, the leadership principles and deal with 100% behavioral questions. Be prepared to not have to answer any behavioral questions. Unfortunately, it's a little bit anything goes these days. Okay, so- moving on um oh yes i love these we have keen wilson here and um you're one of our um academy amazon interviewers it's kind of hard to know at this point because we're transitioning over but you have taken one of our courses and you passed your loop and you're working as an l4 in seattle so i like to take a few seconds to go yay well done Congratulations. Congratulations. We wish you a fantastic Amazon career. And everyone who is here, please do congratulate Keen. 
and clean again. When you're a hiring manager, don't forget us. We'll still be here. But congratulations, it takes a lot of hard work. And the last stat that I heard of, I don't know if you have a more recent one, Evgeny, is that it's about 1% of candidates who apply, so that's the very, very top of the funnel, the application process, who actually make their way all the way through to get an offer. So obviously that's a very big kind of input volume, but nonetheless, 1% keen, that's pretty impressive as an outcome. So well done, congrats. Very impressive indeed. Enjoy, right. Let's move on. Okay. Right. So, did um, um, my point earlier, just to don't want you to think we're ignoring you. We can't tell you what exact questions that you can expect from a functional point of view, from a logistics lead position. Uh, what you can expect at the loop is that you will be asked behavioral questions. You can guarantee everyone that makes it to loop is going to be asked behavioral questions. So make sure that you understand the leadership principles and you know how to answer behavioral questions. I see a question here from Anjana on the writing example that I think we can tackle relatively I, I see it three times is that is that my eyesight or was it written three times no it was written three times i think it's quite it's pretty important for Jana, so i think I think, yeah. I think I think we need to surface that Shoot. one so Anjana, um welcome and the question is for the writing example what's number of words recommended um so there isn't an official recommendation in terms of the number of words um my recommendation and i've been reviewing candidates written samples for um i think over a year right now. My recommendation is that um, try to get the story, your written sample, to anywhere between one page and a half to two pages. There's no need whatsoever to make that narrative any longer than two pages. And if you can make it a page and a half, it's absolutely fine. Less is more. I think anything less than, uh, than a page and a half, again, while there is no set standard, I would just say, maybe try to get it to a page and a half, but that's that seems to be a golden standard. Um, Arial font, I would say 10-ish, 10 and a half, 11. I mean, it doesn't really matter uh, from that perspective. Um, uh, we, I mean, as I said, we've been reviewing these um, samples for quite a while. Gigi has recorded some amazing videos on how to nail that written sample. It's on our YouTube channel. You should definitely check that out. It's, um, I think it's the best guidance on how to nail a written sample. And 99.9% .9 of candidates manage to um, just use that guidance and nail the written sample. In case you do want your written sample reviewed, all you need to do is get our free course, which um, you can get at dayone.careers website. And as soon as you get into our course area, there are links to um, a written sample review service that we do as well. But 99.9% uh, .9 of candidates can just get away and be perfectly fine with the guidance that Gigi has in our YouTube channel. Excellent. Cool. So I'm going to answer this one quickly from Montserrat. So you are more than welcome. I'm glad you find it useful. Usually is the hiring manager your manager or can she be your peer? Is there any pattern? Okay. So the hiring manager is never going to be your peer. They're always going to be someone a level above you. In, I would say 90% of cases, it is your manager who is the hiring manager tagged on your kind of interview schedule. There are some edge cases where it may not be your hiring manager, but another manager more senior than you in the group. Generally, that will happen in kind of the scale recruitment roles, things like brand manager type roles, where the roles themselves, also kind of junior sales managers as well, uh, the roles are so cookie cutter, uh, very replicatable and scale recruited across the business that any any manager who leads a team would be capable of deciding whether this person was going to be raising the bar for that particular role. They act as the hiring manager on the on the loop, on the debrief, but they may not necessarily be the final manager whom you are assigned to once you are given the role. But that's in a minority of cases. In the majority of cases, the HM noted in your interview schedule will be your boss. And therefore, it's really important that you ask them the questions that you would want to ask 
someone who you're going to be reporting to and is going to be a major influencer of your life over the period of employment. Okay, I'm gonna move on from that one. It's a good question from Mia around the number of um, questions in during an interview. I think you and I probably want to tackle this one together because I'm looking at it and I'm thinking something something interesting that's happening here. I'm just going to put it here on the screen. Shoot. And um, so the question is, hey, Mia. So the question is, I was asked four LP questions in a phone screen and have a loop with five interviewers. Should I expect four questions each? which would be coming up with 20 unique stories. That seems like a lot. Um, if it seems like a lot to you, it certainly seems like a lot to me. Um, and um, I would say, and again, Gigi, let's, let's, let's talk this one through because, um, I mean, the fact that they decided to go for four LP behavior questions in the phone screen, um, I'm kind of finding this less and less unusual these days, again, because it's anything goes protocol. But um, and 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 I have heard of some loops in um, AWS and specifically for tech candidates when they were running out of time to um, screen them on the behavioral questions and they decided to do a rapid fire, quote unquote, um, uh, where, yes, indeed, they would be asking that many questions. But in a non-technical loop, when you have a proper non-technical round, and let's assume that all of these are non-technical rounds, I would Im I would imagine. What is it? Um, three questions i mean technically speaking what two questions per lp if they're lucky and if the interview goes to plan so four questions uh two per lp so four questions per interview but um four questions per lp that's quite unheard of isn't it i i think that might be the phraseology i think mia's saying that she was asked four leadership principle questions in the phone screen so behavioral that's questions two per the lp then right two per lp yeah that's yeah. pretty standard i would say that's that. yeah that is pretty standard um yeah and yeah in which yeah, case it sounds like a standard case yeah so i think it does depend on what level you're at so the more junior the, you are the less complex your examples are going to be and therefore the more time there is to ask more questions so an l4 l5 level like that would actually not be a lot as far as I was concerned. I could easily get to five questions on average with an L4, an L5. If you're an L7, then four is still feasible, but at the top end, I'd usually expect like maybe three, uh, four at most for an L7. But I think the point then becomes, should you expect four questions each, which would be coming up with 20 unique stories? That seems a lot. Maybe we should chat again about unique stories and the challenge and how you deal with the challenge of unique stories at that volume. Yes, yes. Well, there, there are certainly some shortcuts that you can take um, in order to um, produce that 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 much content. So um, uh, there's a, they actually don't mind if you uh, use the same professional context um, and chunk it into more than one specific story. Because as you, you know, if, if you're like me, then your professional history probably is full of situations where it was just one situation, one professional situation, but you can recall yourself demonstrating behaviors that would probably uh, map to different leadership principles. And so what you can do is you can take the same professional context, but sell it differently, just sell different behaviors. As long as you understand what leadership principles stand for, as long as you know how to tell your customer obsession from your invent and simplify, if you believe that the same professional context lends itself to uh, different LPs, and as long as when you tell the story, you don't actually tell exactly the same story, you focus on different behaviors, then um, it's perfectly fine. And you can shortcut um, uh, yourself this way. Um, and uh, see, even Gigi's dog agrees that um, it's actually a credible way of uh, managing your preparation. Would you agree, Gigi? Um, should we let Ko in and she can just run the whole thing for us? Yes, I do. <laughs> chaos at my house today um because of course i'm usually so professional this is so unusual for everybody to <laughs> uh, right so i'm back in the room uh yes it's a skill you should all practice seeing how you can reshape your stories for different leadership principles because you never know 
no matter how planned you are, you might find yourself in a situation where you don't have an exact example mapped to the leadership principle related to the question that you're asked. And you're going to need to be skilled to on the fly reshape a story in order to be able to make it reflect the question that you're asked. So my suggestion is that everybody does what Evgeny says, which is find two ways of telling each of your stories, heavily focusing on one aspect of a leadership principle for one version and another aspect on another version. That then ends up giving you far more stories than you would have had. You've got kind of double the volume of stories you would have. And it also teaches you a very valuable skill. Right. Excellent. What else do we have here then, Evgeny? Let's see. There's a, I think there's a question on the star method from oh. FFJ31. So this one okay. is when covering the results in the star method, is it a bad thing if all or most of the metrics used to measure results are, quote unquote, creatively devised rather than conventional? I'm going to pawn this over to you, Gigi. <laughs> <laughs> Because you know I'm the most creative person here, right? Exactly. <laughs> I creatively spelt BS, right? Um, okay, so here's the thing about creatively devised metrics. You have to be able to cope with that double click that Evgeny spoke about at the beginning of the session. If you mention a number, you are going to have to be prepared to deal with follow-up questions about that number. So upstream metrics that might drive into it, downstream metrics that might come out of it, measurement methodology. I cannot tell you how many times in my interview experience candidates mentioned metrics and outcomes that I knew weren't measurable. And then I started to challenge them on how they measured those metrics and all of a sudden it falls apart. There is nothing worse than sending up red flags on making stuff up. So I'm not telling you you can't be creative, but if you choose to be creative, make sure that you can deal with follow-up questions and challenges on your creativity. I think we'll leave it at that and move on. Yes. <laughs> what else? Oh, before we move on now, I, we've got to pause on this momentarily, Evgeny. So this is the point in the show, because, yeah, this is a real high level production we got going on here, where I say to everybody, we say to everybody, we obviously put a lot of work into our free content, not just these sessions, but all of the videos that we put up there, the blog that we have, a lot of effort into this for you. And in return, we ask one very, very small thing. And that is that when you watch your, our content, please do give it a thumbs up or put a comment in. The reason we ask this is those are engagement signals for the YouTube algorithm. The more thumbs up we get, the more comments we get on a video, the more quality YouTube defines that content to be, and it will surface it above some of the complete tosh, quite honestly, that appears sometimes in YouTube in search results. So please, for this video, I'm going to ask you to spend the next couple of seconds just liking this video. I do have to change the theme because I keep forgetting to move this content over. So suddenly we're going back to Amazon interview. We're sorry, Evgeny. I know it's dead. I know it's gone. But just for the moment, I've had to go I'm back a, I'm, to I'm a huge fan. I've always been. <laughs> <laughs> and and while Gigi is doing that, may I just mention that you know the, the, one of the reasons I mean there's a million reasons why Gigi and I emerged, but one of them is that because we're very very honest with everyone and you guys as well, and when we're asking you to comment and like our content, we're telling you exactly the reasons, not just so that you can be notified about the new arrivals of the videos. Yes, that's true. Uh, we just want to make sure that people don't get hooked on absolute rubbish that's out there and then get crashed and burned and then come back to us with a bit of bruises and rejections that's it just being honest with you out there we will pick you up and give you a cuddle and give you some germaline which i don't know if there's a u.s equivalent for germaline i'll have to look that up um for your little cuts we will help you but we would rather not have to we want to make exactly. sure that people get the good quality content from day one so right first time. so i'm going to run a little video and whilst i'm running this video please could you Give us a little bit of a thumbs up, and I have to do a new one of these with you included, Evgeny, which you'll thoroughly enjoy. But for now, here we go. Just a couple of seconds. Please do give us a thumbs up. 
That was amazing. I so enjoyed that thoroughly. Did you enjoy that? Maybe I, I just maybe I just need to make a new one with your face. I don't have to put too much more effort. Unless you want to sing. Do you want to sing in the next one? I'd rather not, but I can okay. dance. Fair enough. Can, <laughs> can you boogie? <laughs> I've got uh, a version of that as well. Right, so I'm sorry, everyone. We have to amuse ourselves somehow. Otherwise, we just sit in these kind of dungeons. Evgeny's room looks like it's really nice. Uh, that is not Evgeny's room. I have to tell you this. That is like some snazzy background. I'm in the dungeon here. Right. On that note, please do like. If you have, thank you very much. If you haven't, please do. Right, should we pick our next one? Before yes, we let's, do that. let's do that. What do we have left? Okay. Oh. Oh, can we just finish off right? FFJ31. I think this is a follow up from your point about correct, creatively devised rather than conventional. But the reason why I've gone to it is this is a common problem that people have because they're not in front end delivery roles. Anyone that's in a strategy role can often find themselves in this type of a predicament where you don't actually own the outcome. You simply made a recommendation for someone else to own the outcome. So I, I would claim ownership. I don't know if, again, if you've got different advice on this one, but I would be claiming ownership or at least contributing ownership to the outcome metrics. Otherwise, what result are you ever going to be able to communicate that your work has delivered for your organization? So if that was me, I'd be framing it up in such that the result was, I made this recommendation to the organization. The organization took that recommendation on board, went on and executed it. And the outcome was an incremental, however much in revenue or whatever the metric it is, that is the output of your kind of upstream recommendation input. Would you be aligned on that, Evgeny, any additional? A hundred percent aligned. Claim a share of output. And this is the, you know, this is the reality. Because, you know, if you think about um, the ingredients and efforts of so many different people that it takes to achieve one output, which is sales, right, in the end. So you definitely, and, and you will never be able to attribute your specific share. And, and you, you, I mean, even, at, even in some very seasoned teams at Amazon, they believe that they can, but you know, not always. So I would say definitely, just like G says, claim your share of outputs if you have rendered a, um, a strong input. And um, that should definitely be enough. And that's fair. And that's how it happens in reality. Cool. Thank you, Evgeny. Let's see what else we can find. It's like a little treasure hunt. Ooh. Oh, we have another winner, winner, chicken dinner. It's not a saying anywhere else other than in the UK, winner, winner, chicken dinner. No? I've, heard, I've heard it from Americans before, but I don't know if these Americans, because they've been sort of, they've lived for too long in the UK. <laughs> okay, so you can let us know whether in where you live, winner, winner, chicken dinner is a thing or not. I suspect it's not. Okay, so Jay Kim, you got an offer from L6 marketing manager. Marketing... Okay. Oh, with four years experience. You've got four years experience and you made it to an L6. I'm impressed. Oh, so definitely you're a raises boomerang. the bar. Yeah, you're a boomerang. Oh, right. So boomerang, just quickly, everybody, what a boomerang is. Uh, aside for the fact that it's something that you throw in the air, it's kind of, it was an Australian, a native Australian Aboriginal weapon, actually, a boomerang. But the idea is that you chuck it in the air and it flies around and then it comes back to you and you catch it. Um, that's a term that Amazon uses for people who leave and then come back a period later. So Jake here has boomeranged uh, back to Amazon and left yourself an L6 with four years. That's, that's impressive. Congratulations. 
Right, moving on. We do love to recognize people who have got their jobs, so that is that. Okay. Moving on, what else do we have? Ooh. Oh, yeah, let's do this one. Let's do this one, Evgeny. Should you ask different questions per interviewer for the loop interview? Okay, so I assume this is at the end of the loop when you have your opportunity to ask questions. Should you ask different questions per interviewer? So, again, I have my view. What do you think? Um, right. Um, so It's fun this because you could just kind of throw it at the other person and then... No, no, no. I, to... I, I... I, l listen, listen. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll share my view on, on, on this. And, and actually, uh, you know, just to, just to sort of prove that, um, you know, I, uh, what's, what's the word that, you know, I eat my, my own poison. Um, I, I, I can tell you my technique that I've um, always used in every single interview in Fang, whether it was at Amazon or Apple, and it worked for me every single time. So, um, first thing that I do is, I approach the Q&A time at the end of the interview as a genuine Q&A time. I'm not trying to impress the interviewer because, quite frankly, if I'm looking for a job, I just want to make sure that I like it. And I have been in jobs that I hated and I could have prevented that experience if I did a bit more questioning, I think, right? At least I could have given myself some signals. So the attitude that I recommend is that A, treat it as a genuine Q&A sessions that will benefit you and your decision whether you want to work there. And I know it's Amazon and I know it's big tech and I know a lot of us when we interview, we're so motivated and we want to impress people. But um, Gigi and I hopefully will both agree on the fact that Amazon or any of these other organizations, they're not for everyone. So make sure that you ask the questions that are important to you. The second thing, and this is my method. I usually go on a fact-finding mission and I'm trying to triangulate the information that I'm getting from different interviewers. So my approach is that everyone's got their own Amazon, right? And these, these big organizations, just about anything you say about them is probably true, right? Because they're so big. And so every single interviewer who's been there, maybe some of them have been there for five years, maybe have, some of them have been there for two years. Some of them might have stayed in the same role, in the same team. Some of them may might have moved around. The point is, they have experienced their own Amazon. And because you have so many of them, what you can do to them is exactly what they do to you, right? They interview you because they want to generate multiple data points. So my approach has been to do exactly the same in reverse, generate multiple data points. So I was rocking up to every interview interviewer with exactly the same set of questions. And I would tell them that I am using exactly the same set of questions that I was asking your colleague, but I just want to get your perspective because, quite frankly, what uh, you know, what, what you what you hear about Amazon in the open space, in the PR releases, in YouTube interviews, that's you know, that is for you as a candidate could be a facade, right? A lot of it is true, but if you're coming in from from the outside, how do you know if any of this is true? So I would have this exactly the same set of questions and I would go from interviewer to interviewer asking them and then literally writing down the answers and trying to make up my mind from all this plethora of questions. What do I think about the organization? So that was my method and they worked like a charm both at Amazon and at Apple, I have to say. Cool. Um, so yeah, my guidance would be the same. And actually we have a video on our YouTube channel. Again, actually, I think our top video questions to ask at your Amazon interview. So it pretty much covers off what Evgeny said there and also includes some specific suggestions for questions that you might ask for different role types. So go check that out. Hopefully that will be useful to you. All right, so there are loads of questions here, Evgeny, like tons. I, we're definitely, it's unbelievable how many there are. We're not gonna make it through all of them. So I'm gonna be a bit more brutal and we're gonna skip through a few more than perhaps uh, the slow pace that we've been going so far and then uh, you can always if you don't get to ask a question here you can always drop it into one of the uh, comments in any of our YouTube videos try and make it a relevant video because then at least we understand the context or of course you can come back next week if you are desperate for your question to be answered there is a functionality enabled here on YouTube which is super chat so you can chuck in a nominal kind of dollar or something like that and it will just um, jump your question to the top so we'll be able to see that so if you're absolutely desperate 
like just chucking a dollar. It's not a money making scheme here, um, but it would just create the visibility. Yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna retire on a dollar. All right, so let's just see what else we've got. Um, okay. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna do this one. So we've already covered off. Can you reuse examples from your phone interview in the loop? Um, and I think we basically said, yes, you can, but if you're going to really focus on telling it as if it was a very different story with a completely different leadership principle, do not use exactly the same example for exactly the same type of question between your panel, your phone interview and your loop, or indeed uh, the interview at your loop. Will they ask the same leadership principle from the phone interview to the loop? So if you don't mind, Evgeny, I'm going to cover this one off. So the smart hiring manager does this. They front load the most important leadership principles for their role into the phone interview. And they do this because it's a high filter mechanism. If someone has to be very strong in a particular leadership principle in order to take the role, you would rather find out if they weren't strong in that as early up the flow as possible. The smart hiring manager does that. Not saying every hiring manager is smart, but let's hope the majority of them are if they've made it into Amazon. So you can assume that you will be asked leadership principles early on that are critical leadership principles for the role. And therefore, you can assume those leadership principles will come round again when you get to loop because they want to revalidate that you don't just have one incredible example for that leadership principle, that you can show consistent high performance in that leadership principle, because that's what they need, because it's the most important leadership principle for the role. So the short answer is yes, you should fully expect to get the same leadership principles at loop as you did in your early rounds. And that is why. OK, going to move on then. I think there was a question here, someone ab about identifying the bar raiser at the end, and I wanted to make sure we covered off that so we could get on the soapbox about people trying to sell you snake oil about bar raisers. Where was that one? Oh, I can't find it now. Never mind. Go on, you pick, Evgeny. Are you looking? Are you looking? Yeah, go on, go for that. Oh, I can't hear a word you're saying, Evgeny. Oh, I, I have no idea why I was on mute. I was just love talking to myself for some reason. Um, so uh, this one is from Orlando. Hey, Orlando. Um, he said that um, he failed to get hired last week in France. Um, sorry to hear, not the end of the world, as you will know. Um, they loved everything except that he, he, he was unable to give relevant data to the final panel. The recruiter told him to apply again in six months. Should I wait more? Um, to be honest, um, from what I can tell, if the real reason is that you could not, um, and I'm going to have to reinterpret what you've mentioned in here, uh, you couldn't give relevant data, but probably couldn't establish the impact of your content or your stories or your accomplishments so they couldn't figure out if you could if you will raise the bar at that level or not or probably concluded that you wouldn't then I, if you genuinely believe that that is the case and if that is the case indeed then i would say um I, I'd, I'd say reapply in six months um and i wouldn't uh wait more that being said if there is a concern that for example what you've got in your career experience um, wasn't enough and it wasn't just a question of interview prep um, in terms of knowing that you need to use data to demonstrate the impact of your accomplishments but um, maybe you haven't got the right complexity or the right scope of roles that um, that get you ready for the role then in this case I would wait more. Do you agree Gigi? Yeah you want to just give yourself the best chance of being successful and therefore you know, if, it's, if you don't have material, new examples or impressive examples in that period, then it might be worth waiting a little bit longer. Like Amazon's always going to be around. Well, I say always. I hope they are because I've got some shares, but <laughs> the opportunities will continue to be there. Okay, should we pick another one then? 
Yes, let's do it. I'm looking for one. Oh, I'm going to do this one. So for Marie. So you went to panel about 18 months ago for the same position. Can you reuse some of the examples I used during first loop for the next interview? Um, so shall I cover that one, Billy? Yes, please. Next. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the next one for myself. Yeah, let's do that. We should probably, yeah, I think that's what we should do is just like cherry pick the ones we want and then add this one. Right, so we're pretty new at doing this together, by the way, everyone. I've been doing this by myself for about a year, and I think this is our, third, our second or our third one, so sorry for the slight comedy duo <laughs> thing going on. Although, to be fair, I think you can expect that. It's just been baseline. Right, so you went 18 months ago. Can you re reuse some of the same examples? I would say absolutely yes. You could reuse some of the same examples. But what you're definitely going to want to do is tap into the last 18 months. If you didn't make it through 18 months ago, there's some, something happened there, right? Either um, the bar was much higher than your examples reflected, somebody else picked you to the post, don't know. But the baseline is to assume what you had before is going to need to be improved on if you want a different outcome this time. So I would say pick the best ones that you had from 18 months ago, and then pick a selection of new ones over the past 18 months and have a combination of both would be my suggestion. Did you find a new one that you like to look up, Evgeny? Um, yes, I, I, I mean, I, I think it could probably do, um, I think it could probably do two of them they're they're short so here's one of them Shoot. so how do you determine what level an account manager position is uh, i'll widen the question which is how do you do, how do you how do you how do you figure out what role the position is um so for some roles it is easier to figure this out just by reading the title for some roles it isn't for um, most roles in sales if it's an account manager it's usually an l5 it's if it's a senior account manager it's an l6 um roles that have um uh, pre uh, the, that start with senior manager or head of in most cases not in always but in most cases or principal they tend to be an l7 um, but then um, in some of the other more um, let's say in uh, the likes of um, data science machine learning and other scientific roles it's a complete mishmash so you wouldn't be able to tell the best thing to do is ask your recruiter some will tell you some will not but that would pretty much be my guidance anything to add to that Nope. nope. And then there's another one here which we can do uh, really quickly. And so this one is from Cobain. Hello. Uh, thank God you're alive, Court. Um, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> Have you heard about Taylor? Heartbreak. Oh. Heartbreak. Um, I know, right? Um, so hi, Gigi. On the uh, pre break Call with the recruiter mentioned some LPs to prepare on. Do you think I should focus on the mentioned LPs or all LPs? Well, like it depends on how many they mentioned. If they, uh, let's just assume that you've got a uh, classic L6 loop, five, uh, five interviews, and they mentioned five LPs. So they might have given you the critical LPs, in which case you should really focus on those, but that's not going to limit your prep um, because you're going to have two per interview. So, um, I would say um, just count how many interviews you're going to have in the loop and assume that there's going to be two leadership principles uh, per interview. And um, go back to your recruiter and ask whether these are um, the ones that the hiring manager believes are the most important ones. Um, uh, and um, ask for more. Um, increasingly, candidates that, um, um, that I've been dealing with uh, were advising me that the recruiters were just emailing them the entire set of leadership principles. So it is happening. No guarantees that you get them, but no harm in asking. Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to quickly pick this one because this is a common question. So VJ, hey, welcome. Thank you for joining. So should you... How should you start your preparation for program manager role for London? Okay, first of all, beautiful place, awesome building, love it, and uh, amazing lunch in um, the market nearby. So hope to get the job. More to the point, how should you start? Right, so uh, we have a playlist on our YouTube channel, which is called Start Here. So I definitely recommend you start there. 
The other thing is I have, we have on our YouTube channel, I will get used to we at some point, Evgeny, I promise. Um, we have on our YouTube channel a video which is 10 steps to prepare for your Amazon interview. So I would suggest you take a look at that one. That will get you started. And the other thing I will say is we're going to finish up very shortly. We'll probably answer one more question and then I have to go and have my dinner. I don't know if you've had yours yet. Um, we're going to give you a freebie. Uh, probably the best freebie, I think, available on Amazon interview preparation, if I don't say so myself. And that will get you started in terms of really being able to understand the most important leadership principle, which is customer obsession. So you should definitely take that and check it out because it will get you very well started for how you need to think about all of the subsequent leadership principles. Totally free. You'll love it. So that's my tip. Start here in terms of our playlist the 10 steps and then take the freebie that we're going to give you in a couple of minutes. So should we aim for maybe two more questions of Genny? Yes, let's do it. I can, I'll pick this one. one. Yeah. So, um, Jagadesh, uh, the question is, should I write up two stories for each LP and edit them to make them more concise and crisp? I'm hearing a lot of feedback from other candidates on being concise. Um, I think um, being concise, let's, let's start with the, the intended result and work backwards. So being um, concise and crisp, there's uh, no, no harm in that. As long as we caveated with the fact that if your opening story is concise and crisp um, and the interviewer believes that they want to hear more details, just be prepared that they're going to need that second layer underneath your concise and crisp story. So just be ready with that. But generally speaking, there's nothing wrong. And the fact there's every uh, thing that's gonna work for you if you are concise and crisp. Um, we are generally recommending that you don't necessarily limit the, the amount of time for your story. Um, and you know, when, when candidates ask me, what's the ideal runtime? I say, well, hey, there isn't one, but if you have to time yourself, then you know, shoot for, I don't know, seven, eight minutes, absolutely fine. As long as it's the story that's worth telling. Now, how do you get there? Everyone's got their own method to their madness. Sounds like what you want to do is write the story and then shrink the story. That's one method. The method that um, works for me and that I'm recommending is that you do two things. You write out a headline um, like um, uh, with a title like from the, um, uh, the episode of Friends. So the one where... Jagandesh saves the company from going bankrupt, uh, bankrupt. So that's how I used to write them out. And that immediately kicks my brain into remembering, ah, okay, so it's that story when I did um, that thing. The second thing that I do is rather than write the entire script out, I bullet out the main points of the story. And I use the, uh, the star method outline or the more in-depth framework that we're offering in our paid courses. And the third thing that I'm doing is I want to make sure that I've got a section for goals and a section for results. And I want to make sure that the KPIs in the goals, in the results are the same and they match up. So that's my method, but definitely use whatever works for you. Cool. Yeah, so I just wanted to add one little maxim to the end of that, which is being brief and being concise are not the same thing, right? Brief is not providing much information. Being concise is providing the information with as few words possible very different things. Be careful not to fall into the brief trap. Okay, last one then. ATA. Oh, you've subscribed. Thank you. Um, does level offered relate to the overall experience or just the role expertise? Can a level up be offered if one does well in interviews? Okay, so the level that you will be offered is a combination of the assessment that they've made on your functional skills and the assessment that they've made in terms of the data that you've provided on your behavioral interviews. So the level is a function of the evidence that you have provided. It is not a function of the years of experience that you have had or the number of certificates that you have detailed on your resume slash CV if you're here in Europe. So they will determine what level they believe you are at based on a comparison between the evidence you provide and the level everyone else inside Amazon at that level above, that level, the level below or the level above is performing at. That's the first part. Can a level up be offered if one does well in interviews? Yes, but it is very rare. Leveling down, much more common. Leveling up, 
very rare. So yes, it is possible, but in my time interviewing and bar raising at Amazon, I think I can probably name twice where we have concluded at the end of loop that this person is operating at a higher level. And even then, you can't necessarily give them the job at a higher level. If you're going to up level someone, there has to be the scope of work. You can't just hire someone at a higher level job to do the work of someone at a lower level. So to get up leveled, the scope increase has to be possible within the role. And that would be a conversation between the bar raiser and the hiring manager for the hiring manager to convince the bar raiser that they can provide that incremental scope to justify a level up. Anything to add to that one, Evgeny? Nope. I only know two people since I started coaching who uh, actually were up leveled uh, and a lot, lot, lot more who were down leveled. Down leveled. Yeah. Okay, cool. So on that note, everyone, we are done for time. Before you go, we are going to give you what is, without question, the best freebie available for Amazon interview preparation. Please go to, you have to do your side of the screen because you're, you're over the banner more than I am. I'm going to put your fingers like pointy downy. That's it. Right, everybody, go to this link here. You will get our free Amazon interview with customer obsession taste a course. It's going to tell you everything that you need to know to nail the customer obsession questions that you get at your interview. It teaches you about our learning model for the leadership principles. We have a unique learning model that we designed, devised, designed, devised at Day One Careers, both of them, all of it, um, only with us unless someone else has chosen to copy it, but we created it. Special learning model for how you understand the leadership principles. It will tell you exactly what your interviewer is looking for from your behavioral answer on customer obsession. And then there's a little mock interview of me interviewing me uh, so you can see how it all comes together in the actual interview. We give it because clearly we want you to love our content and buy more, but equally we give it to you because it's good quality. It's not one of these kind of cheap old freebies that tell you nothing you can't do anything with. It's quality product. So if you take it, guarantee it will be useful to you. I think we're done. So we're going to thank everybody for joining us. I'm so sorry we couldn't get through all of the questions. But like I said, if you want to ask those questions, you can bang them into the comment section of our YouTube channel and we will attempt to get back to you. Uh, yeah, nothing else to say. So I'll say goodbye. Do you want to say goodbye, Evgeny? I'm going to say goodbye. It's been a pleasure answering your questions. And I guess we'll see you next week. Yeah, we'll see you next week. And as, as a British comedy duo used to say, it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from him. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't say that, Evgeny, because I'm not him. Nope. No, I cannot. <laughs> All right, folks. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Be safe. Look after yourselves. And we will see you next week. Ciao. See you. Bye. Bye.